How you doing, faith family? You guys doing well? Yeah. Excited to be in church today? Three of you are excited? Yes. Who's enjoying this new series we're in called The Pursuit? Learning how to follow Jesus. We've been basing it around this scripture in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. It says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. Today, I want to talk about purpose. How do you go after your purpose? When you're following God, sometimes going after your purpose can sometimes feel like it's a puppy and it's off the leash and you're trying to run around and you want it, but it's kind of hard to grab. It's not really listening to you. My father recently contacted me. He's had some health challenges, nothing crazy, but he contacted me and said, listen, Grant, I'm getting a bit older. I need you to go and get all your blood work done. You're my son. And so anything I'm at risk of, you could be at risk of. And so he said, go and get your bloods done and just make sure everything's fine. And so I was like, okay. Now, the thing about me and blood work is I hate needles, hate them. Now, I know sometimes when I say this, people are like, but you've got tattoos. I don't know why. It's different. To me, it's different. I can lay there for 10 hours and just let some guy I don't know that well just hammer my back with a needle. But when it comes to just going to a clean doctor surgery, the needle feels bigger. It feels professional. I don't like it. And so I went, I went and saw the doctor and she said, yeah, that's fine. We can get all that stuff tested. Come back next week. Make sure you're fasted. You can't eat anything because some of the tests won't show. And so I said, no worries. So I left it about seven weeks because I was afraid. <laughs> And the doctor called me. She said, hey, I haven't got your blood done. Like, when did you go and do it? And I said, well, I haven't. She said, why? I said, oh, I don't know. This, this weather's changing and <laughs> being busy and <clears throat> trying to stay indoors, you know, trying to keep safe. I said, you know, I don't want to put myself in another risk. And she said, you need to go and do it. So I said, okay. So I went in last Friday and the doctor said, when was the last time you ate? I said, I ate about an hour ago. She said, well, we can't do it. And I said, well, it is what it is, I guess. We can't do it. <laughs> And she said, you need to come back Monday. Like, there's no way around it. So I went back Monday. Uh, Whitney didn't come. So I was like, oh, I already felt a little bit nervous. And I'm walking in there. And she's like, what do you need, sir? I was like, oh, I'll get my blood work done. She goes, okay, come sit down. So I go in there. And I could feel it. I could feel the adrenaline pumping. I could feel the beads of sweat. And, and maybe it was the adrenaline in the atmosphere. But she said to me, are you okay? And I said, oh. I said, I don't like needles. And she said, oh, really? You've got a lot of tattoos. And I said, oh, it just doesn't feel like it's the same thing. I feel like, I don't know. I just don't really want to do it. I said, is this going to take long? She said, it'll just take a few minutes. And she said, have you ever had your bloods done? I said, yeah, but not in America. I said, you guys do everything different. It's a little crazy over here. So I don't know what you guys are going to do. And she's like, it's okay. And she said, it looks like you've got some nice big veins. And I thought, okay, well, I'll take that as a compliment. I've got some nice big veins. And and so she grabbed my arm and I was like, oh man, I could feel it. I could feel the blood just going. And I'm not kidding you. I woke up. <clears throat> this is true. I woke up with a Capri Sun in my hand because it's got sugar in it. A nurse that I hadn't seen before waving an alcohol wipe in front of my nose. And my feet were up. The other nurse had a fan on me and my hair was blowing back, and I was so embarrassed. And I'm like, oh no, it's happened again. And I was like, <laughs> she goes, are you okay? And the other nurse was kind of giggling a little bit, and I was like, oh man, like not a time to be laughing at me. Like, I said, did you do it? Did you get it? She said, we got it. I said, look, I've got to go. She said, you can't, she said, you can't go. You're green, like. And I said, it'll be okay. I looked in the mirror, and I was like, white and my hair was everywhere and she walked to my car and I said listen it's fine just tell the doctor to call me I've got to go I rung Whitney and I said this is why I don't do this stuff alone but I had a purpose my, my dad was concerned and good news is I got the, the blood results back everything's fine so I'm all good we can move on but it had a purpose right but in the purpose there was a problem. What do you do when you're trying to do something that has purpose? Maybe you feel like it's your purpose. What do you do if you feel like you've got all this potential that God's given you, but in it, it's got problems? A lot of the times, as a pastor, one of the main things that prevents people from pursuing 
their purpose is the feeling like their problems are interfering with their purpose. I love this quote. Uh, It's one of my favorite quotes. It's by Alfred de Souza. Get this. He says, For a long time, it had seemed to me that life was about to begin, real life. But there was always some obstacle in my way, something to be gotten through first, some unfinished business, still some time to be served, and a debt to be paid. Then real life would begin. At last, it dawned on me that these obstacles were my life. Whether you realise it now or not, whether it's conscious or subconscious, you're probably using a lot of your time and a lot of your energy trying to create two different realities. One of the realities is where life is perfect. You've got no problems, the money's flowing, you're you're knocking back opportunity, people are affirming you, people see your gifts and talents, you're seen, you and your spouse are getting on well, you've just met somebody, you're going on good vacations. It just feels like everything is in its place. Then there's this other world, a world we don't like to go to, a world sometimes we get dragged into, and it's this other world where all of my problems exist. And often what we do is we try to, when something from this world tries to creep its way into this world, we usually try to pray it back into this world. Or if it seems to make its way there, we usually use our energy and say, I'll be back soon. I've got to take this. This thing doesn't belong there. This, you, you don't belong here. I've got to take you back over here where I don't really talk about this place. Uh, I try to hide this place. And so I'm going to put that thing there. And a lot of us, without really realizing it, usually are making this transition happen a whole often because we don't like problems to exist where we have purpose. I want to read a scripture today that talks about wheat and weeds coexisting. I think this text reveals how God sees problems and purpose and how they coexist. If you've got your Bibles, open them up to Matthew 13, starting in verse 24. It's going to be on the screen behind me. I'm reading from the NIV translation. Matthew 13 starting in verse 24. It says, Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, and then he went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds, tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Jumping down to verse 36, the crowd left the house where Jesus was talking about this, and the disciples asked him in private, can you explain to us the weeds in the field? Jesus answers, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man, referring to himself. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one. And the evil one who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. The harvesters are the angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they will weed out of the kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into a blazing furnace where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. No doubt we would categorize this scripture as eschatology or even in some ways uh, apocalyptic. It's describing what will happen at the end of the age, what's going to happen at the end of times. But it also provides incredible insight into the schemes of the enemy and how he attempts to resist the purpose God has for believers. 
It really shows us how the enemy sows problems amongst potential. How he sows problems amongst potential. Jesus tells him this, and, and he outlines it. He says, the man that sows good seed into the field, he says, that's me. And the field is the world. The good seed is the people of the kingdom. He said, when the enemy comes, he sows weed amongst the wheat. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the evil one is the devil. He says, the man's servants asked him if they want him to tell them to go and uproot the weeds so that it doesn't disrupt the wheat. And he says, no, don't do that. He says, because there's a time coming where my harvesters, who he describes as angels, and the time of harvest is the end of the age. <clears throat> but one of the categories Jesus doesn't clarify is, who are the servants? So if the field is the world, and the good seed is the people of the kingdom, and the harvesters are the angels, well then who are the servants who are helping the owner grow the seed? You might be thinking to yourself, well, is it the church? Well, it comes in stages. You see, the field is the world, and he sows it. And the people who are being born into the kingdom are the ones that are beneath the ground, and something is taking place, and they're small, and they're trying to germinate. Once they complete that process, they start to bear fruit. It says in John 15, verse 8, Jesus talking, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Another example is in Matthew 9, it says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, Jesus had compassion on them because they were harassed like a sheep without a shepherd. Then his servants, the disciples, say, he says this to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out more workers into the harvest field. So you have a seed that is put into the ground. It grows, and they are the people of the kingdom. But once it has grown and it understands the process and the method that God uses to grow people, and it bears fruit, it then transforms into something else, like a servant who then treats the field like it's their own and starts to help the master. This is what we call discipleship. You come into an environment, maybe it was in a moment of worship, or maybe it was on the street, or maybe it was at a small group, maybe it was in next steps, maybe it was in a conversation at your work, but someone brings you the idea and sows a seed of what the kingdom of God is like, and it's kind of like this small little thing that makes its way, once it germinates and it starts to bear fruit, you then transform into something else. And that's why the disciples, they start off as random fishermen tax collectors, one was a zealot, and they get transformed into, the scriptures say, a disciple. As the story goes on, they get transformed into apostles. And they died biblical heroes. 2,000 years later, we're still talking about what they did. This is God's purpose for your life, is that something small would begin in your heart and it would begin to grow and bear fruit. Once you understand that process, it's your job then to serve the master and help other people bear fruit and protect the other smaller, less established plants from being damaged, bearing fruit. Whilst this is God's process, the enemy also knows this. And so as God does this process, the enemy is always trying to plot how to stop you from growing to the next level. He does this by sowing problems amongst your potential. I want to talk about the good and the bad coexisting. How problems and purpose coexist. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while he was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. And so Jesus tells this story. He then clarifies who everyone in the story is. And he says, this is what it's like. He's, it's a parable. He's trying to describe and tell them what God's doing and what the enemy's doing. And he says, a man went into a field and sowed good seed, seed that had potential. 
There's another scripture that refers to seed and it said it may start off as a small seed, but it's going to grow into something where people can sit beneath it and it provides shade and birds will perch on it. And so the man goes around and it's Jesus and he goes to certain areas and he starts to sow good seed and maybe he goes over to an area there and he says, I'm going to plant good seed and I'm going to grow that person into becoming a minister of the gospel. And then maybe he goes over here and he says, I'm going to plant good seed and I'm going to raise this person up to be in the political field and have convictions and start to learn what it is to live a godly life. And then I'm going to put this person in the education system and this person is going to protect my children and they're going to help them disciple and grow into who they need to be and this person I'm going to put into this industry and this person I want to make a great mother and this person I want to make a great father. And after the hard days of work, the owner goes back with the servants who have been helping the owner do this and they go back inside and they rest. And while they're sleeping and the sun sets and darkness covers over the field, the enemy comes in. Now, the enemy doesn't come in and just randomly scatter seed wherever he wants to. No, 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 no. The enemy's strategy is to go where God sowed purpose and start to sow problems. And he starts to say things like, oh, this person wants to grow up and be a minister. Okay, well, then I'm going to give them a dysfunctional relationship with their father, and I'm going to make that person grow up and not believe in themselves. So I'm going to make it hard for this person to become a minister. This person wants to be in the political field. Well, then I'm going to put them in a circle of friends where they find affirmation and they start to compromise the convictions of my word, and I'm going to give them problems. This person goes over here, and he says, oh, I see this person is going to be in the education system. I'm going to give them a disruptive and a destructive relationship that they're going to get into and it's going to thwart my processes. And before the servants or the owner wakes up, he goes and he leaves. He didn't announce his arrival. He didn't knock on the door in in the bright of the day and say, I'm going to come and take you on. In fact, no one even saw him come. It was only the owner that recognised the evidence of the weeds that made him say, an enemy has done this. Now, I don't want to question God. I really don't like that I think like this, but when I'm reading this, I'm just going to be real, I'm like, well, why don't you just beef up the security then? (laughs) I'm not the smartest person, but I'm thinking, well, how many servants have you got? Why don't you divide them into two groups? One works the day and helps serve serve the master, and then the other guys can do the night shift. And so what the other servants at night can do is they can protect the field from the problems. Like, why are you allowing all of that hard work to be possibly compromised just to let the enemy just waltz in? Like, why would you do that? Why not just divide some of the servants up and say, we're going to just hire more servants to be security? Like, and I'm thinking, Lord, I'm not smarter than you, so what am I missing? And maybe that is the problem. Maybe we're so addicted. Maybe we're so hungry. Maybe our little brains can't comprehend. How can something good and bad coexist? Maybe the problem is we think too little of God. Maybe you and I think, how on earth are you going to bring your purpose about when all this stuff around me is going wrong? Maybe we compare God to each other. Because I know some people, you resource them, they can do good stuff. You give me a lot of good resources, I can do some pretty good stuff. I don't think that's that difficult, right? But only God. Only God can make stuff thrive amongst chaos. Only God can stand there and say, don't touch it, let it grow. Let it grow. What does God tell us? 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, be alert and sober of mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Doesn't say to pray away the lions. It says be alert because they're there and they're not going anywhere. You're going to coexist with them. I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, 
be as shrewd as a snake and innocent as a dove. He says he's like a lion. Lions do do most of their hunting at night. And their eyes over time have adapted to the dark, which gives them a huge advantage over its prey. Not only that, lions actually enjoy hunting during storms. Because while the prey is startled by the atmosphere and the environment, it's distracted that there's another threat looming. You see, we want a life without predators. We want a life without storms. We want a life without problems. And I don't know what it is. I, I'm not even proud to admit this. There is something nice about over here. I get it. I'm no better than you. I, I like it. I love it. You know when you get that parking spot right up the front and you go to buy a shirt and it's on sale? You're like, Lord. Go, go to lunch with a friend. Hey, the Lord just impressed on my heart to pay for you. Man. I've saved like $100 today. I can spend it on something else. My wife does that sort of stuff. Girl math. Girl math, that's a thing. Stop the girl math. Not everything, so you didn't get everything cheaper because it was on sale. We love it. And it's so shocking when something bad happens, isn't it? It surprises you. The servants are like, didn't you sow good seed here? Why is there problems? Like, you sowed good seed. The owner wasn't surprised. He instantly says an enemy did this. Straight away, an enemy did this. And I recognize, and I agree, that problems amongst potential is stressful. It's discouraging. It's horrible. It, it feels, oh, are you really with me, Lord? Like before when I was over here, I kind of felt like you were with me. I felt like we were on track. We had momentum. It was all happening. Now I'm kind of feeling like, oh, I'm doubting whether you're even really with me. I'm doubting whether you even see it. But it's funny. If you just remove that type of thinking and you just take God at his word, get this, and you just look at the text alone. That's all you do. Get this. If you just remove that, right? Because I agree. I can think like that. But if you look at the text, your problems are really confirming how much purpose is in your life. Because the enemy doesn't throw seed randomly. He looks for where God wants to grow something and he sows a problem next to the potential. You see, you thought that your problems were evidence that God wasn't with you, but your problems are really evidence that God has great purpose in your life. And that's why the enemy is so intimidated by you going to the next level. Are you following what I'm saying? If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Where God intends to grow, the enemy will sow. Where, the en where God intends to grow, the enemy will sow. The enemy is going to sow. Wherever God has a plan, he's going to sow right next to it. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No. He said, no, 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 don't. Don't do that. Don't do that. Because while you're pulling the weeds up, you may uproot the wheat. Now, I've heard people preach this, and, and I don't know if it's entirely true the way I've heard it, and, and I'll try today to give you a better explanation of why the owner in an agricultural sense, would make this statement. It's referring to, uh, he uses the word zazana, and which is in modern botany terms, it's referring to wild rice grass. And so he's saying there has been this type of weed and it looks identical to wheat. You actually can't tell the difference of it. The only time you can really tell whether it's a weed or it's wheat is when the head appears, the wheat, the head of the wheat will droop down and the weed of the darnel, that's the name of the weed, it'll just keep shooting up. And so he's, it's nothing about roots or it's not about foundations. He's saying, you don't have the eye 
or the expertise to look at it because while you're trying to rip out what you think is a problem, you could actually rip something out that I'm doing. And he's saying, no, 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 I don't want you. I don't need you to do that. I don't need you to do that. I want you to leave it. You see, God is like a surgeon. You ever been in a relationship that you got into it and at the start you're like, my Lord, the, the Lord's blessed me. <laughs> Two years later you're like, I think I just dated the Antichrist. <laughs> and you look back and you're like, oh, that was the enemy. <laughs> you ever got a job and you put in a praise report, God just opened up a door, gave you my dream job. Six months later, you're praying to get out of that job because it's horrible and it's chaotic. You see, we like to think that we know how things are going to turn out. We like to, it's comforting to think, I know, I speak to people all the time, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And in 20 years, I think you don't know what you're going to do. (laughs) Some of the things in your life right now that you've underestimated, I'm telling you right now, God is going to grow something significant. He's going to grow something significant. There's other things right now that you've lowered your guard. And the Bible says to be alert and sober of mind because you don't know what it's going to be. Don't throw your pearls before swine. Three people know the word. I shouldn't have done that to you guys then. I should have just said it. But it felt good to test you. Let it play out. Let it play out. It takes a lot of faith, a lot of patience to let it play out. This is not an easy task. It doesn't feel good to let it play out particularly if you like control. I've been having this problem with my house. I've been waking up the last two or three weeks and I'd go out the front and there's like this styrofoam, like foam all over my driveway. And I'm like, did someone like leave a package and it's like going everywhere and I couldn't work it out. And maybe I was a little bit ignorant. And so like after the third day, I'm out there sweeping it and getting my air blower out and pushing her onto the street to someone else's yard. <laughs> My neighbours actually go to the second service. I didn't say that in the second service. (laughs) They really did. They were sitting there. As I said it, I was like, I'm not going to say this. (laughs) Because they're going to be like, man, I thought someone had a package and they were just throwing styrofoam around. So I looked up and there's these birds nesting in the top of my roof. And they've eaten out a piece of foam that I thought was stone. And I, I was tempted to say, look, I'm not a tradesman. I, I, my father's a tradesman. My stepfather's a tradesman. My father-in-law's a tradesman. I'm a pastor. <laughs> and so I'm a little bit vulnerable when it comes to this sort of stuff. I'm not, I'm not very helpful around the house. I talk to you. I, I, I prefer to pay people if I can to, to, to do that sort of stuff. And so I was, I was out there Friday night and I was walking around and I was looking at it and I'm thinking, man. So I got the garden hose out. This is probably the extent of how I, how I do things. And I'm just squirting it. <laughs> and it was so lackluster. I'm just thinking, man, it's not even really reaching. And I'm like, so I called a friend from Rio's Roofing and I said, I need a pressure cleaner and I need a ladder. And he said, we can sort you out. So he comes over on Saturday morning. This is yesterday. And this ladder, I tell you, I've never seen a ladder like it. Like, it must be a Texas ladder. This thing... <laughs> I could literally touch the ceiling with it. And I'm thinking, this is a big ladder. And he just left me. I'm thinking, man, I'm not very qualified. So Whitney had gone out to get lunch, and my eldest son was there. And even he was picking up. Man, I don't know if Dad's got this. I'm carrying this ladder around. It's falling. I'm like, just stand back for a second, mate. It'll be all right. Just... I've done this sort of stuff before. Don't... <laughs> don't mistake these soft hands for someone who can't work. <laughs> I know how to get down with it, right? Just stay there for a second. So I'm on this ladder. And he said to me, and I kind of forgot, he said, don't wear um, like flip-flops or bare feet. This thing will, it's got a bit of pressure in it. So I'm in flip-flops and I realise that I was up at the top and I'm like, it'll be okay. So <laughs> I got my son, we're in the garden because we're trying to reach the, the thing and he's like up against this tree. And I'm like, have you got it or not? And he's like, yeah, I got it, dad. And I'm like, this is pretty tall, mate. If I come off this, something bad's going to happen. And then he's picking up that I'm a bit nervous. So anyway, If you've never used a pressure cleaner before, the difference between a pressure cleaner and a garden hose, pretty significant. (laughs) Hence the word pressure cleaner. And so I'm like straddling this and it says, do not straddle this ladder. And I'm like, man, I'm in flip flops, I'm straddling it. And so I could barely hear my son, I was so high up in the air and he's looking at me and I'm like, it'll be all right, mate, don't worry about dad. 
And I'm thinking, all right. And so I fire off his pressure cleaner and man, he threw me back. And I'm like, just swaying around in the wind, right? Just mist everywhere. Doesn't look like it's shooting anywhere. So I get down and my son says, was that supposed to happen? I thought he was talking about how I looked. He pointed, I put a hole through one of the parts of my roof. <laughs> and I said, son, just jump inside for a second, mate. Dad's got to process some stuff that it's not going to be kind of So go inside, go make your dad a, go make your dad a sandwich. I don't know where mum is, just go make me a sandwich. <laughs> Whitney rings me, she says, what do you want for lunch? I said, you need to get home. I said, I put a hole in the house. She's like, why do you always do this stuff? Why can't you just wait? Why? You know you're not good at this sort of stuff. <laughs> you see, when we have problems, we are unprofessional in dealing with them. And we rush to fix things early. And now I had to call Rios Roofing back up to say, can you come out and repair my roof? <laughs> They're thinking, man, this brother's all over the shop. I said, look, the good news is I wore my shoes. I didn't straddle the ladder. Everything's good. I'm safe. <laughs> when we have problems, if you like control, you'll rush into it. And he says, no, 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 don't touch it. Don't touch it. He's really speaking about timing. It's really about timing. This is referring to timing. And what's even deeper than this, he doesn't even ask the servants or the people of the kingdom to even deal with the problems. It's the harvesters who deal with the problem. And so what is it right now that you, in your unprofessional mindset, <laughs> what are you rushing into and God's saying, hey, just let that thing play out. Just let that thing go for a few more months. You don't have to have that conversation tomorrow. No, 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 don't try to, don't try to earn money in another way that you've got no idea. Well, just trust me for a second. No, no, don't try and, don't try and call everyone to, to, to make yourself feel like a victim. You're not a victim. You're my child. Don't try and get people to feel sorry for you all the time. You're my child. Before you even ask, your heavenly father already knows what you need. He already knows. If you're taking notes, write this down. Number two, I must learn to trust that God knows what to leave and for how long. I must learn to trust that God knows what to leave and for how long. The owner says, let them both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, not you, first collect the weeds, tie them in bundles, burn them, and I'll bring the weed into my barn. Seed. Seed, it's just really potential is what it is. It's hard to see what it's going to be. And when you're looking at it and you think logically, you would think to yourself, well, why is God, why is God putting something so valuable in such a dark place? Such an isolated place. Such a dirty place. It's lonely. There's layers upon layers of things on top. Some seeds don't see the sunlight for months, years. And if you're not careful and you're not alert and sober of mind, the enemy will say things to you like, God's buried you. God's buried you. You see, you bury things that you have no expectation that they will rise. But you plant things that you want to rise. You see, burying and planting look like the same action. And where we're vulnerable is if we get too in our feelings, it feels like God has buried us, but no, 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 no. God has not buried you. God has planted you. And there is an expectation that you would rise. How does the seed rise? It struggles. The outer husk, 
it breaks off. The water and the mud and the dark and the isolation and the pressure start to push off the outer husk. And the seed, if you've ever seen one of those videos, it struggles, it struggles, it struggles, and it struggles its way into the next stratosphere. You think that God's not with you because you're struggling. But God wants to tell you today, the struggle is the way to the next level. It's not your enemy, it is your friend. Your enemy is the one telling you God is not with you. Is there anyone who's in a struggle? Is there anyone right now where you feel like, I feel like God's left me? Let me encourage you and put some fire back in your bones. The difference between burying and planting is there is a plan, there is a purpose, not only for it to germinate, but for it to become strong, for it to bear fruit, for other people to benefit from it. That's why the enemy is so convinced and hell-bent on convincing you that he has buried you. If you're taking notes, write this down. The struggle is what enables me to reach my full potential. It is the struggle that pushes you to the next level. If everyone could just stay in their seats for a moment, I just want to pray. If you feel comfortable, just close your eyes. I'm not going to pull you down the front. I'm not going to do anything weird. just want to give you an opportunity to respond to what God has shared today. And I pray that Whatever did hit your heart will remain and whatever was my own words would drift away. Every eye closed. I'm not going to pull you down the front. Just want to give you a moment between you and God. If you feel like right now you've been buried and you've been listening to the enemy's lies, if you've been struggling to understand that purpose and pain can coexist, if you've been confused at the time, the length, the duration that you've been in a dark, a lonely, an isolated place. I want you to raise your hand. Put it up nice and high. You can do it with conviction. It's just between you and God. You're not responding to me. You're responding to God. Put your hand nice and high. Respond to God. Lord, you see every hand. Leave it up. You know what they're going through. I pray right now, Lord, courage into their hearts. Courage, Lord. Give them strength to struggle. Give them strength to struggle. The struggle is their friend. The struggle is the process to unlocking their potential. I pray for wisdom, Lord. Let them be able to discern the areas that they have to leave because you are not finished your work. That's a word for someone. God is not finished the work that he has begun. Let God finish the work that he begun. Some of you right now, you're trying to make phone calls and you're trying to recruit people and you're trying to throw money at your issues and God is saying, just leave it alone. Leave it alone. Trust me. Let this thing play out. And when the time is right, I will send my harvesters to do the work that needs to be done. Lord, we ask for that in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can, you guys can put your hands down. Just stay in your seat for a moment. Please just stay in your seat. I want to pray a prayer. This is a really important moment. I want to pray a prayer that maybe you don't know who Jesus is. Maybe you've never responded to the gospel. What is the gospel? It means good news. It means that There is news that you need to hear. If you haven't heard this news, I want to tell it to you. The Bible has a lot to say about the way we live our lives. God has a lot to say about the way we live our lives. And throughout history, God has communicated that humanity, through Adam and Eve, inherited something called a sin nature, which means we are born into sin. It's hereditary. It doesn't matter how nice of a person you are. It doesn't matter how good your parents were, if they were married and they loved you. There is something inside of every human being that is born into this earth in this current time where we are born into sin. What that means is that no matter whether I saw it, whether anyone saw it, you missed the mark of perfection. God's standard is perfection. God is holy. He is righteous. 
And so his standard is perfection. The Bible says everyone has fallen short of that standard. Now, I know some of you are very nice people, but I'm going to take God's word on it, that somewhere, even if we didn't see it, you fell short of what God expected, and that was perfection. The Bible also says the wages, what we're owed for sinning, is death. Now, it's not referring to death like you're going to die and it's the cessation of your life. No, no, it's referring to the eternal separation from God. We're all going to die at some point, but we're not all going to be eternally separated from God. And so the cost in order for your sin to be taken care of is death. That's why when Jesus came to earth, he said things like, I am the Lamb of God. I must die and I'm going to be raised back to life. Jesus died for the sins of the world so that anyone who believes on what he did on the cross and God the Father rose him from the dead, well, then they would be saved from eternal separation from God. You might be thinking, well, this is pretty elaborate. How do I go about receiving this? The Bible says all you've got to do is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. We don't have to go to the Middle East. You might be thinking, can I facilitate it? Anybody can facilitate it. This is the good news of the gospel. Jesus tore the veil. He tore the barrier that stood between humanity and God the Father. And you can walk boldly into the presence of God because of what Jesus did on the cross. And so I want to give you an opportunity to respond to this. Every eye closed right now. Once again, I'm not going to pull you down the front. We're not trying to make a spectacle. We just want you to have a moment between you and God. Every eye closed, please stay in your seat. If you know that you haven't prayed this prayer, if you haven't received Jesus and asked for forgiveness and received what he did on the cross, in a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm not going to pull you down the front. I'm not going to put a light on you. It's just going to be between you and God. But if that's you, on the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three. That's awesome. There's hands going up everywhere. Put it up nice and high. You're not responding to me right now. You're not responding to a preacher. You're responding to God. You're saying, I I receive what Jesus did. I don't want to die for my sins. I want to receive life. I want to receive what I don't deserve. That's it. Thank you. I see that hand. You guys can put your hands down. You guys can open your eyes. Hey, Can we pray this prayer together? I know a lot of people raise their hand, but the Bible says if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, then you'll be saved. And so what we're going to do is we're going to confess with our mouth. And if you you, you lifted your hand then, I want you to think about these words. Say them with some conviction. Project your voice. Don't let the enemy try and squash you down. Gosh, I feel this. Some of us who have been walking with the Lord for so long, stop letting the enemy squash you down. Get your voice back. You're a son. You're a daughter of God. Start to get your fight back. Start to struggle your way to the top. All right, repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you are who you say you are. I believe you died for my sins. Forgive me from all of my past. Walk with me all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's give it up for Jesus. Thank you for joining us for Faith Family Online. We hope this service was a blessing and an encouragement to you. It's always an honor to have you worship with us from wherever you may be. If this is your first time joining us, we want to give you a special welcome. You can text the word FAITH to the number 55498 to connect with us and learn more. But don't stop there. You can join us in person every Sunday at any of our campuses. For more information on service times and locations, go to our website at myfaithfamily.org. Again, thank you so much for joining us and we hope to see you soon.